what we what we really wanted to do was it was to see whether we could identify anything like a neural signature of emotion, and it's building off of uh, Marcel's work with uh, with Tom Mitchell, where they uh, found that they could they could identify a neural signature of of words of concrete nouns, um, words like house. There was like a representation that they could identify, and it was one that was common across people. Uh, and so we wanted to do something uh, similar with emotion. One of the hard things for us to figure out was, um, so building from, from those studies that, that uh, Tom and Marcel did, um, when they're trying to figure out the neural representation of a word, it's very easy to show someone that word six or 10 or 12 times. And, and the nature of fMRI is that all the data are noisy and you have to have people experience the stimulus multiple times. Uh, with emotion, that's not that's not super trivial, right? So if I if I ask the average person, you know, feel afraid right now, and then 10 seconds later, okay, feel happy, and then 10 seconds later, feel disgusted, it's a really difficult task. Uh, but we sort of needed to do that uh, to to make the experiment work, and so we used uh, CMU's. Uh, theater department uh, students there that were all professional actors and they're really good uh, at, at putting themselves into these emotional states. So that was one of the big challenges was just figuring out a design uh, that would allow us to you know get participants to experience the same emotion over and over again um, without you know changing the emotion and, and making sure that the emotion is strong enough each time and, and consistent uh, all of those things that are necessary for us to, to make any statistical inference. The other thing we wanted to do was um, we wanted to see whether you know we can identify these neural signatures of particular emotions and whether they're common across people um, but we we're worried not only about it being actor specific but also about it being you know something about imagined emotional experiences rather than emotion more generally. So you could there, there could be a situation in where um, imagining anger is is easy to infer, um, but it's not the same as other types of anger. Um, and, and we used disgust as a check for this because disgust ends up being very easy to elicit. One of the things we were able to do was for any one person, we could, uh, we could take the neural activation uh, that they had from some trials and predict what emotion they're experiencing in other trials. So this sort of says that for any of our actors, for any of our participants, when they were experiencing anger, they had a consistent set of neural activation. So it was consistent within person. Uh, the second thing we were able to do uh, was to predict the emotional content uh, or the emotional experience of a participant using the other participants. So we have 10 actors in our study. What we could do is take any one actor um, and look at their brain data and predict what emotion they're uh, experiencing based on the brain data of all of the other participants. So without sort of training, without sort of understanding their brain activation at all, look at their neural activation and make a guess. Not 100% of the time, um, but sort of well above chance rates. Um, the third thing uh, we're able to do is to take the neural activation in response to sort of these imagined emotional scenarios and predict the, the content of these emotional pictures, whether they're discussed or neutral. Uh, and we can do that at significantly above chance rates as well. Um, and then the last thing we're able to do is to, is to take all of those neural activations and, and run them through a uh, factor analysis, which is with a, a statistical technique to help us understand what is the underlying structure of the representations. So how is it that anger and happiness and disgust differ? Uh, and so we're able to uh, recover some dimensions which sort of tell us about the structure. Uh, and the dimensions that we got out, one was valence. So it turns out, not surprisingly, I guess, uh, that positive emotions like happiness and pride look very different than negative emotions like sadness and disgust. Um, one, of, uh, one of the dimensions also sort of common in the literature uh, was arousal or, or energy activation, this type of concept, so that uh, a high energy emotion like um, anger, it looks different than a low energy emotion like sadness. Um, and then we had one factor that, that was um, a little bit novel. People have talked about it before, but it wasn't something that we uh, necessarily expected to see was uh, the social content of the emotion. So some emotions like uh, envy or lust 
they, they sort of necessarily involve another person, and those look very different in the brain than uh, emotions like disgust, where most of, most of our participants sort of disgust scenarios didn't involve another person, so those look very different. And the fourth, uh, the fourth factor that we found uh, was one uh, for lust. So lust seems different from all of the other emotions, sort of like another finding that we had, uh, you know, going into it, one of the questions that we had internally among our team was whether lust would look more like a negative emotion or a positive emotion. You can imagine it could be both, that sort of lust is sort of like a, it could be a positive state, but it's also sort of a wanting state, it could be negative. It turns out that it was neither, that lust looks different from all of the positive emotions and all of the negative emotions. Uh, and, and the fact that we have like a separate dimension of lust in that underlying structure is sort of speaks to In terms that. of the, the implications, uh, one is that it, it can be an exciting method, I think, for understanding how people feel about any different type of phenomena. The, the way our classifier works is we, you know, we can show people a stimulus and then uh, the algorithm gives a readout of all of the emotions in order of, of how much the, the neural activation represents, uh, the representation is like what you'd expect in those emotions. So you can, um, you can imagine a situation where you want to know how people feel about a brand. Um, and you could uh, have a classifier that's trained on a particular person, show them a brand image, and you could see, well, that brand makes them uh, happy and a little bit envious, or sort of like they find it a little bit disgusting and sad. You know, you can, you can get a, uh, a sense of people's emotional reaction to any type of stimulus using this type of method. One of the things that, that we're, we're excited to try out is to see whether we can guess whether we can identify emotions when people are trying to suppress it. So if we show people a disgusting image and we ask them to sort of try not to be disgusted by it, can we, can we still predict the emotional content of the image? How sort of robust is, is this technique to, to deception in that way?